Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our third session of the Thought Leadership for Systems Transformation Program. And we're very happy to uh, host Nora Bateson today as our guest teacher. As you know, uh, Nora will share her reflections on the collective narrative that uh, you all produced as a group, and then we'll take questions. And with that, Nora, the time is yours now. Okay, so reading over your thoughts, I guess where I wanted to start today uh, is recognizing that sort of under everything that I'm doing and everything that you're asking, there is a similar inquiry, which is really about how how does change happen in a complex system? And more particularly, how do we, you and me and anybody who happens to be interested, take part in that change? Um, hopefully toward a direction of increasing vitality and continued life. Okay, so that's kind of what I heard and felt into your questions. And they, they came from different directions, but that was kind of the underpinning. Um, and uh, I'd like to sort of begin by pointing out the paradox in all of that. Um, there's a couple of paradoxes in it. One is that we're already in a lot of change. It is changing. We are changing. And that change is underway. So, um, and right now it's actually pretty rapid. Uh, coming out of the couple of years of the pandemic and prior to that, the changes were already underway also. We're in fairly significant culture, cultural, economic, ecological, um, and, and, and personal change. So how do we make change when we're already changing? And the next part of that question has to do with who actually are we? Where is the I? Where is the me? Where is the agency in this question of being in a complex living system and somehow being a, a, within it and somehow being part of helping it to go in, into a direction that is not so destructive. Um, my dad used to talk about warm ideas. And warm ideas were ideas that were within their relational process. Um, not extracted and pulled out and isolated from life, but ideas that led to more life. He asked the question, what is the pattern that connects? And it's um, the, the full question from his book, Mind and Nature, is what is the pattern that connects the orchid to the primrose, the crab to the lobster, and all the four of them to you and you to me? And in that, you have an idea that is actually pulling your attention into those relational connective processes. He's asking us to make a leap, to make connective tissue between, uh, between an orchid and a primrose. Okay, those are sort of alike, but now we're gonna, we're gonna go to something else. How about a crab and a lobster and an orchid and a primrose? What do they share? And how about you and me and a crab and a lobster and an orchid and a primrose? What are those connective processes? He's created some gaps there and let us fill them because what we do as living beings is actually see relationships, make connections. It's what we do. We don't, it's, it's not a matter of can we, we already do it. It's a matter of which relationships we're seeing. If that weren't the case, for example, there would be no reason that a Prada bag would have any value. When you look at a Prada bag and you see a set of relational processes, relationships that indicate stature, that have, that have all sorts of connotations about, um, about class, about fashion, about timing, about all sorts of things. So the, just, just looking at the fact that we do see relational process we're just looking at a different set of ecological ideas 
okay? The ecology of institutions, the ecology of existing systems is an ecology, and it's very inter interdependent. It's totally knitted together. It's absolutely alive and moving. Problem is, it's actually deeply out of sync with the other ecology, which is the one in which there is air and water and the possibility of continued life. So, um, we're in both, okay? We're in both. And how do we of both, because the deer and the, you know, the, the owls and the earthworms, they don't think much about taxes and they don't worry too much about Prada bags and they don't really care who's president. They're not on social media. They are in another ecological set of relationships. But we're in both. You are largely bacterial cells. Um, you know, I think it's like one in 10 cells is human or something like that. The rest of you is, is water and bacteria. So it's a good idea to ask, who am I? What is the self? Where's the edge of me? Am I my ideas? Am I my family? Who am I? Uh, am I my history? And there are moments when I could look at, you know, my own being and say, I, I'm totally unique. Theodore is totally unique, right? Prashant is completely unique. And the way that the experiences of your life, the way that you have had your heart broken, the way you were held by the person who cared for you, the way that you were in school and who you met and all the things that have happened to you, your, from your DNA to your diet, to your musical taste, to your love affairs, to your broken bones. You are a very unique set of filters and experiences. And so when something happens and there is an event, your observing of that event is unique. And my observing is unique. And what I can perceive and what you can perceive are, are, are not necessarily wrong. They're just different. And, and actually, we would gain quite a bit if we could compare notes. Right? Okay, fair enough. That's all good. Hmm. But when I look at all of those filters of who I am and where I came from, and I ask, which one of these are mine? Which of this is actually me? And the answer is none. They all come from my contexts, historical context, physical context, geographical context, cultural context, economic context, familial contexts, health context, all sorts of political contexts, right? Technological contexts. So what of me is mine? And what you have is a paradox, right? I am me, but I'm not me. I am my context. But what does that even mean? So I'm pushing this because the first thing I want to do is actually question how it is we're thinking about agency. Not to take it away, but to give it the paradox it needs. Because in that paradox, you get a lot of tension. And in that tension is attention attention to the question, am I perceiving my world or am I perceiving my perceptions of my world? Now, it's that second one that gives us a lot of lift. It's the second one. What kind of positions and conditions can I put myself in where I might start to notice the limitations of my own perception? Because that's fantastic. Right? The second you start to see the edges of your own epistemology, that's the moment you get to play with it. It's a very important thing to be in, in that uh, modality of being able to perceive your perception. Okay, so 
I, I started an institute, a research institute, and we started with the question, we thought we were very clever, right? We, we, we started with the question, how do systems get unstuck? And we thought that was going to be a very relevant question. Looking around at our world, we were like, okay, this is the thing. The economy is stuck. The education system is stuck. The health system is stuck. The political system is stuck. Everything is stuck. It's like the world's in a giant addiction, and an addiction is a stuckness, and we're stuck. So we thought, yeah, this is, a, this is, this is the question. This is the research we want to do. But the more we started to ask the question, what is a stuck system, the more that started to reveal itself as being a question that um, was ill-conceived. And it was ill-conceived because when you have any aspect of a living system, which you have managed to create some sort of stability in, that stability is produced by having lots of change around the edges, okay? In order to keep the economy at a particular level of a gradient, there is all kinds of shift needed from um, natural systems to human systems to, right? All sorts of things are upside down at the margins to keep something in the center still. Now, which center are you drawing? If the center is the ecological system, imagine the upheaval that that will create in our social systems, right? If we try to stabilize our ecological, I mean, this is why we're not doing it, right? Because to, to actually stabilize, in, in so much as one can, the ecological systems that we live within so that they can continue, we would have to actually completely and totally abruptly upend most of the way we go through the day. It's inconvenient, to say the least. Um, so what is a stuck system? And what happened next was interesting, because the best example that we could come up with for a stuck system was to think about the body in paralysis. And the body is a system. And bringing this down to the level of the body is a really great thing to do, always. It's always my touchstone when I'm thinking about systemic process. Okay, but the body, does it work in my body? Because here's my own onboard living system that I have to reference various concepts that I might come up with. Um, and so the body and paralysis seem like a, at, at least an example of a stuck system. We went to a clinic in Italy that was working with paralysis and they were using a lot of Batesonian ideas and it was interesting to see what they did. Um, and in fact, I would go so far as to say to this day that clinic is doing the most significant form of systems change, what you might want to call transformation, of anywhere I've ever seen. They get it. And they get it in a way that I wanted to share with you because I saw this in your responses. Okay, so there's nothing beeping in this place. They're not pumping anybody full of drugs. There's no surgeries going on in back rooms. Um, the way that this clinic is working, I'm going to give you an example, okay? So you have, um, in most cases, have any of you ever worked with paralysis before? Um, in most cases, what you're going to see is at least if it's a half or perhaps a whole body in paralysis, you, you, it's, it's presented through a constricted arm and a tightly clenched fist and this there's a tightness here there's a frozenness in this half of the body for example and it presents through this rigidly closed uh, arm and so the way that most <coughs> and there's Blake um, the way that <coughs> Blake is barking at a cat who's named Huxley <coughs> So Blake and Huxley are having a conversation over there. We were just getting to the good part. So 
most of the time, the focus would be to, to come to where the frozen thing is and to apply some sort of physical therapy, acupuncture, massage, various types of processes, right, to, to this frozen bit. Uh, but they don't do that. Not at all. What they would do, and what I witnessed the first time I was there, one of several hundred therapies that they have, is they might have, okay, I have, you have to use your imagination, a little wooden block. Here's my little wooden block. And in this little wooden block is a carved out spiral. Can you imagine that this is a carved out spiral? It's not just drawn on here. It's carved. Okay. And the practitioner would ask the uh, patient, sorry about the terminology, but the two human beings are talking to each other. And the one asks the other to describe what it would feel like to move their finger around this spiral. Not to do it, but to describe what it would feel like, okay? And that's not really a very easy thing to do. I mean, even for you and me, we kind of struggle with it a little bit. Now, what I want you to notice is that in doing that, the person with the tight, with the part of their body that's frozen um, is needing to access memory, visual, tactile, verbal, relational processes of cognition and to integrate them into communication that is in context with this person they're talking to. All right. Now, then the practitioner, if they have a hand that is still feeling, they would move their finger very slowly, move it around that spiral. And when they come to the end, they ask the question, not what did you feel, okay? But what was the difference between what you thought you were going to feel and what you felt? Now, they've just doubled it, right? Because they have to think about both feelings, both experiences, and to articulate the memory of what they thought and the experience of what they had, right? There, there's a whole lot of cognition happening in that question. And through this process, these um, people are actually learning to be in their world in a new way. And that, and that, that reconnection uh, um, of these different cognitive processes stimulates the possibility for the arm to open and the paralysis to open. And so there's all sorts of fantastic things happening here. Um, and I'm hoping that you can, for those of you who were in the warm data thing the other day, you might see a similar pattern. Okay, so what what's happening is that there are multiple contexts of ways of knowing that are coming together in a kind of a moire phenomenon. They're, they're coalescing. And as they coalesce, something is happening. There is a mutual learning between the processes of cognition of visual, memory, tactile, verbal, etc. A mutual learning of these different systems. So uh, I started to realize that this was really important, that what was happening here was really important, that they weren't putting them, they weren't fixing these people. They weren't putting them back how they were. They weren't solutioning them. They were actually creating the conditions in which their specific living systems could be in a state of mutual learning. All right, so people had very different pathways to their healing. They didn't have, you know, markers. Now you got to get to here. Now you got to get to there. Here we're going to measure your healing. Where, where are you going to measure that? How do you measure the way visual and verbal and, and 
you know, memory are coming together. Where's that measurement? You can't measure that. So, um, yeah, so I realized we were asking the wrong question. The question was not how do systems get unstuck, because they don't get unstuck. What happens is they learn. And when they learn, the stuckness is irrelevant. It vaporizes. It's beside the point. It's not even on the docket anymore. So you're not solutioning for stuckness. You're creating the conditions for mutual learning. That's what warm data is all about. It's not creating solutions, it's creating the conditions for mutual learning. So I, I made up a word, and this word uh, has the preface of sim for together, a Greek for together, and mathesi, which is Greek for learning, and the word is semathesi, and it means trans contextual mutual learning. And um, I saw that this was actually a needed for realm of study for any kind of living systems. When you look at a tree, okay, when you come to a tree in the forest and it's a crooked tree and you can say, let's make that tree straight. That tree, that tree isn't, you know, it should be straight and tall like the other trees like it in the forest. Why isn't it straight and tall? And if you ask that question, you're going to come into it thinking of how you're going to correct the tree. Right? And the issue is not in the correction of the tree. If you ask the question, how is the tree learning to be in its world? The kind of response that you come up with is very different because immediately the perception goes to a transcontextual interrelational mutual learning process. How is the tree responding to where the light is, where the wind is, where the water is, where the soil is, where the insects are, right? So if you're looking at that crooked tree and thinking, how do we fix this? You're probably asking the wrong question. And if you want to come into this with a systemic idea, going into the mutual learning, looking at the ways all of these organisms are actually responding and they are shifting, they are moving together through time. And so often in the study of systemic work, we have a snapshot of a system that's frozen in time that completely blinds us to the possibility of seeing that it's changing, that there's mutual learning, that the organisms are where they are because they're moving together. And this is a significant head boggler because the question is, how do you even think about the information? What is information when you're looking at transcontextual mutual learning? And that's where warm data came from. Is that we came to that point and we thought, uh oh, we need another species of information, a whole different kind of information that can be alive. Because this information changes from different directions, it changes in time, it doesn't, it's not stable. You can't prove it, you can't measure it, it, it defies that. So the question is, what is information that's alive? Now, there's plenty of room in the world for reductionist information. We need it for all sorts of things. The thing is, if we use it for the wrong things, it's deadly. Pull things out of context and you don't understand. You, you, it's impossible to understand how they are in, com in, their, in their complexity, in their ecology, in their multi-relational interdependent process, which is, of course, life. We can call it complexity. We can call it systems. We can call it all sorts of stuff. But listen, it's just life. It's life making life. Life lifing. And the thing about life is it's not static. So the way in which each of us has become a crooked tree in our own way um, is, is, a, is an invitation to ask how are we learning to be in our world? Okay, 
Samathasi. Now, I spent 10 years working with Samathasi and warm data. After 10 years of research in this space, working all over the world, in lots of different communities, in lots of different places, um, here's what I learned. Let me save you the decade that I just spent. Um, I learned that organisms in interdependent relationships change but by the time they've changed the actual thing that has been happening that produced that change has been in play for a long time so I I sort of shifted my my um, attention from looking at emergence, you know, things that are happening, things that are coming out of the system, and started to ask, hold up, what's submerging? What, what is it that has been coalescing in ways no one was paying attention to, no one could perceive for a long time that later turned into this thing, okay? The, 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 the fish grows a leg, where the heck did that come from, right? The, 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 there's a, an event that happens politically. There's a, 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 an, you know, something happens in a marriage or a family. Something happens in your body. Where did it come from? And um, what I started with was the idea, and I know you guys have been watching the Afani Poesis thing, um, I, I, I started with the idea that most of the issues we're facing right now are insidious. You can't tell somebody to respect somebody else. You can't just make them do that. Um, things like corruption, things like addiction, things like racism, things like sexism, things like all, all different kinds of greed and consumerism and love of Prada bags, okay? It's insidious. And you can't just tell somebody not to do that anymore. Don't want that bag. It doesn't work like that. So what what have what can we do with that? Okay, so so I looked up insidious and I saw that there was this definition that said that it was this gradual coming together of events and experiences that produce something harmful like cancer okay there's a million examples of this uh, and I started to ask the question what would it be like to think about this actually as a theory of change and to recognize that um, you know the story of the guy who's looking for his keys under the lamppost right and and this the person comes up and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for my keys. He says, is this where you dropped them? He says, no, I dropped them in the forest. He says, why are you looking in the, under this lamppost? And he says, because this is where I can see. And for the most part, what I am actually witnessing is that people are trying to make change upon the things they can see. But in fact, the deeper coalescence of unseen processes that have produced that issue is where the change is. Now, I'm going to shoot high here for a second, and I'm going to ask you a question just to think about. It's, it's not, you don't, I'm not asking for an answer. How does an organism know how to evolve? Okay, and I'm asking you that question because I want to push you into see to recognizing that if change comes into the familiar, if we try to push change into our familiar patterning, what happens? We metabolize it into familiar patterns. That's what happens. 
And we figure out a way to have all 17 sustainable development goals, but keep living exactly the way we have been living. We put the change into our familiar patterns. Um, and, and this is pretty much impossible not to do, by the way, because in order to even be able to perceive it, it has to have enough familiarity that you can glom onto it. All right, so when you first listen to a piece of music you've never heard before, what do you do? You listen to it with the experience of your life and anything that is familiar you catch. Right, you first taste a food you've never had before. And what do you do? You go immediately to, oh, this is like that. You find it through your familiar. But evolution actually requires that there be a zone of stuff that is not catchable in familiarness, into the familiar modalities of perception. It requires that there be, afani means unseen, by that I mean unseen, untasted, unsensed, unknown, right? That, that, that there must be something unseen. Because it's in that unseen place that change can actually happen. The second it comes into this space that is familiar, it gets put into the patterns that are already in play. Um, Afani poesis is about the becoming that happens in the unseen realms. It's, um, it's recognizing that there is a need not to shine a light on the unseen and find it and disclose it. No, no, no. But to tend and to recognize that it's in those unseen coalescences, the way that things are coming together, the experiences that you've had in your life, that have met each other and made sense of each other. The heartbreak that you have had that helped you make sense of a song, that helped you understand somebody else's experience. The language that you learned that has resonances in other languages that you can make connections. These experiences of just what it is to have breakfast at your house as a child and who you are right now. And these are the things that we're not looking at. We're looking at carbon counts and we're looking at various forms of diagnoses that have labels and we're counting various sorts of, of crimes and we're looking at all sorts of things. But probably, according to me, <laughs> the most important realm is that realm of experiences that are coming together in ways we do not know, we cannot know. So I come back to where we started and I ask you the question, who are we? What does it mean to participate in this thing you're calling transformation. How are you learning to be in your world? And how are those unseen coalescences making change? So this is at the core of the warm data work. Um, and I recognize that it's pretty different than what you're used to hearing about. Um, and um, I'm okay with that. I'm gonna push there because I'm pretty sure that trying to find direct corrective in a complex living system um, is a way of perpetuating all the same problems. So um, I'm, I think we are at time. That was a record. Um, Wonderful. 40, <laughs> 40 minutes on the nose of Samathasy, the paradox of agency and a funny poesis. Ba-boom. So now let's open it up. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nora. Yeah, that's great. And we do have questions. So let me call for questions. Hi, Nora. Amazing to be here. This uh, situation about the paralysis and of the lab uh, having access to really many hundred such uh, modalities. How did they get to that as an entry point to initiate the healing process? So how did they deal with trauma, essentially? 
That's a really interesting question, uh, Amara. Something really interesting is happening with trauma. In fact, we have a whole sort of grouping of warm data work on trauma. And it came to be called not trauma. Um, and the reason it came to be called not trauma is not because there's no trauma. It's because what happened was increasingly, um, you were there the other day in the, in the warm data session, right? Okay, so increasingly what is happening is that there is a perception shift from thinking this is an event that happened to me to being able to see how it weaves between stories and people and contexts and recognizing, ah, this event is not actually in me. I'm living into it and through it, but it is not of me. It's happening in this transcontextual process that I am within. Okay, that shift is huge. Is huge. And one of the things that we are seeing with that is that it changes the whole parameters of the question from how are we going to fix the individual's trauma to people coming together to make changes in the system that they're within. So it becomes a, 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 an ex, a shared generosity and um, an experience of integrity in another way. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And I also am um, careful with it because I don't want to make a thing of it. The last thing on earth I want to do is promote the warm data process as some kind of therapy because the whole idea of therapy is also locked in that whole colonial concept. You know, that, that is the whole colonial concept has to do with those, that something's wrong with the individual. That was the, the, the eugenics of individualizing um, people. And, and, and what, what's lost is that there is, that healing is communal. It's mutual healing, mutual learning that is going to make healing and, and mutual learning that creates the trauma. Mutual learning that gets us into the crooked trees and mutual learning that allows there to be movement. What I'm interested in is the movement. What I'm not interested in is making a projection of what the outcome should be or what healing looks like or where it should go because as far as I'm concerned, that's none of my business. People go where they need to go. The connections happen as they happen. The pathways are totally unique every time, and they should be so. They should be alive. They should be a completely stochastic and on, and on their own, own, own aphonipoesis, right? This, this realm of possibility is sitting right there. But most of the time, uh, we, we don't go there. We go with what we can see, trying to change what we can see instead of making a space for things to reconnect that we can't see and let them reconnect without an agenda, right? Like in this example, the way that those cognitive processes are connecting in each person is totally different and unseen by the practitioner. It's unseen. The healing, the movement, okay? And that's, I, I think I'd rather call it movement even than healing. Um, the movement that's happening there is is um, is not seeable. It's not it's not it's not mine to see. It's, it needs to be unseen. It must remain outside of existing perception until it emerges, and then we'll see something. But don't go trying to dig up the seed to find out what the apple tree is going to look like. Right? Let it grow. Let it be. Let it move. Let it become its own tree. Hi, Nora. I was in the session last year. I was in the warm data lab. Uh, I remember you talking about how, like, you never know what happens when people leave and what goes. Well, so I've been in a one year and a half, like, impact <laughs> mm -hmm. from, from, from the, that first conversation around the self system, 
and the process of being with how I learned to be in my world. And I'm one of those people who's like stubbornly longing for metrics. (laughs) And like, I cannot give up. I hear you say completely stochastic and don't mess with it. Don't dig up the seed. And I still want to build. So my question is, what would you say to save me a decade? (laughs) Right. So what I want to give you the example of um, borrowing books. I am someone who has trouble returning books that I have borrowed. (laughs) And I am also someone who's right now in a major collapse of a chunk of my life. And what happened today as I'm in the crucible of like breathing through that is that I saw a book that I haven't returned. And for the first time, that book, which I've sat next to and ignored for two years, like I was, you know, seeing it, but not seeing it today for the first time, that book talked to me and it allowed me to ask this question, who is the one who doesn't want to return books? It was like this conversation. As soon as I saw the book today Mm -hmm. and I asked myself, who is the one that has trouble returning books and why does she hold on to the book? Mm. And what is she afraid of? It was like there was flow happening. What enables that flow? What helps me orient towards it? What, What are questions I can ask others in group context that help me orient? So... So what's at the core of the sort of a funny poetic theory of change is not the idea of action. It's the idea of readiness, hmm. right? You use the word ripening. You, you, you noticed it. You already got it. And where does that come from? Well, I'll give you a quick answer to that one. We have no idea. And you cannot trace it back. Forget about the causality. It's going to need a transcontextual multi-experience that's going to move things. And this is the thing with warm data. I never know what's going to happen. Is someone going to quit smoking? Are they going to, you know, contact their child that they haven't spoken to in 12 years? Are they going to suddenly start returning the books that they borrowed? Are they going to come together and work on their community in new ways? I don't know. It's not mine to know. And it may be that that ripening, that readiness that you had today or, you know, whatever, just comes out of some kind of something that, that, that overlapped in a new way. There was some new overlapping between contexts. And the one thing I want to say is that, you know, please note But in that question my father asked, what is the pattern that connects? The orchid, the primrose, the crab, the lobster, you, me, and actually there's one more in the quotation and it is the backward schizophrenic. Okay, seven organisms. We are not talking about twos and threes. What we're talking about is connective processes that are moving between many things and in that multitude that's when you're going to get closer to what is actually happening in nature. All right. When you look at an ecological system, what one of the things we do is that we assign purpose, singular purpose to each thing. Okay. This thing does that, that thing does this. No, every organism in an ecological system is producing life in multiple relational processes that look totally different. The antlers that are there to to defend the deer from a mountain lion are also decomposing in the rodent poop into the soil. Okay, so what's the purpose of the deer? Amongst, you know, many other things that are there, there's probably, we could name seven different interrelational multi organism relationships that make relationships that make relationships but when you are looking to make vitality you can't look at the first order it's not about undoing the hand it's about creating the conditions in which the hand the whole person is learning to be in their world in a new way and who will that person be what will they go do we have no idea 
And searching for the causation is an old habit. So I would say, um, notice it, but don't chase it. Um, however, there, you know, last time we talked quite a bit about propaganda. And if you don't have enough contexts to make connections between, you create insidiousness. That much I can, I can say. I can't completely say how you create vitality, but I know that if you use too few contexts. All right, so in another thing that came up in your guys' questions from your piece was this idea of, you know, what's the story? How do we change the story? Okay, and, and I want to, for my part, just be rebellious here and say that it's the wrong question. It's super trendy. It's super captivating. Forget it. It's the wrong question. I'll tell you why. Because stories come out of questions. They come out of tensions. All right, we ask the question, what's the purpose of life? Oof, you get a lot of stories that come out of that. Is, are, is it the stories that you want to change or the question? If you look at any good story, what you're going to see is that it's got, it's got polarities in it. Any, any good story is the, the good guy is going to have, you know, evil aspects. And the, 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 every aspect of the story that is captivating is in the tension. So if you want to change the story, don't change the story, change the tensions. Change the questions. And then the story is the second order. The story is a consequence of the questions, of the tensions, right? So it's like that with the Afani poetic question. And, and back to that question of, of what does it mean to actually hope or try to participate in the process of allowing there to be transformation in the world that we live. I'm not a big fan of manipulation. There is no part of me that ever ends, enters a warm data or any other thing thinking, I think you should think differently. Um, but what I will do is put lots of things out there and let you take them where you want to take them. Let stick what's going to stick. Let connect what's going to connect. But I don't want to be trapped in the linearity of strategy. And so um, I am hoping to keep that stochastic. In Warmi data, we try to represent things that happens in relation and also words, like we also use words a lot to represent, to label things. And I was thinking about like, how do we expand this space from poetry, from music? Okay. So I think that if you look around and you pay attention and you look at your life or your day or your situation uh, as an arrangement of whatever's, okay, as an arrangement of experiences. And there's the breakfast that tastes like this and is served like this. And there's the the, the shape of my house and it's like this and there's the clothing and the operationally way I'm looking at time and how I'm setting up my day and it feels like this and you start to ask how do these things speak to each other that I'm living within instead of looking at the breakfast and analyzing the breakfast start to look at the arrangement of your life and pay attention I'm just going to repeat this to how the, these various aspects are in relation to each other. What are they producing together? The problem is not breakfast. The problem is not clothing. The problem's not the gas. The problem's not the marriage. The problem's not, right? But as an art piece, what is your life? And if you look at it like that, you may find that there are aspects in the arrangement that, like a poem, like a piece of music that you want to shift or bring new things into to allow there to be new movement with between them. Um, 
I think the arts are probably the most important thing that we can actually participate in. Uh, because they remind us about that arrangement. You know, like in a warm data lab, for example, um, the importance of what's happening there is not in anything anyone said. It just absolutely doesn't matter. It's not about what you said at all. In fact, what's more interesting is, the, to, is to notice those things that you chose not to say. Right? That's much more interesting than what you said. Um, because that's where you start to see that you adjusted. You made, a, you were perceiving systemic process, perceiving all sorts of things, and you made an adjustment. What was that about? What happened in your perception that shifted that? So, you know, if you make a transcript of a warm data lab and think, what can we harvest out of these conversations? Wrong question. Totally wrong question. It's not about that at all. It's about what sort of soil came to be that after the warm data lab, you two days later, you find, oh, I think I'm ready to return these books. How odd. Where did that come from? I'm ready to quit smoking. Where did that come from? Right? And this is the difference between submergence, cooking and moving and shifting, and then becoming something versus trying to take the something that's already happened and push it back under the ground or fix it. So for me, this is, you know, what, what you're getting at here um, is, I mean, this is why we need the arts. And, and the arts push us to see things in ways that we weren't anticipating we would see them. Um, I have a, a little bit of a difference with the kind of craze around imagination right now. Um, because most of the stuff in your imagination is actually the fodder of existing experiences. So be careful. Because the things you start to imagine are actually coming from the same soil as the stuff you're living in. So unless there's a soil change, watch out. Um, because the new doesn't come from there. The new is going to come out of these unexpected, almost random, right, stochastic, overlapping, coalescing processes. How does an organism know how to evolve? How does it know how to do what it's never done before? How does it know how to live in ways it's never lived before? That somehow this aspect of life is intrinsic. There is a cache of possibility that must be unseen. So that when the context shifts, there is a space for it to come out. It becomes ripe. It's ready. Thank you, Nora. Great. So it's time for closing remarks. I actually uh, want to say we have a warm data lab course or an in-person course taking place in the UK um, in May. And um, there's links for it. And I'll, I'll give them to Theodore to pass out to you guys. Uh, if you're interested, some of you said that you wanted that information. So I just want to be sure you get it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that the entire project that we're in right now can be labeled in multicolored boxes and called SDGs. It can be parceled off in various committees with data plans and agendas. It can come in various grant programs. But in the end, I think I want to encourage you not to look there. Don't look there. Look at life. Because life is already doing it. Right? If you, if you look at the, the image of a mother feeding her baby, all 17 SDGs are there. And none of them. We don't need that. It's a compartmentalization, a reductionism. What we need to do is remember what 
how to how to allow for life to keep making life to feed the babies right to feed the babies is to make sure that the water is clear that the air is clean that the soil is clean that the babies can feed their babies it is our job to make sure that the babies can feed their babies and those babies can feed their babies and that the people who are growing the food can feed their babies and that the people who make the clothes for the people who grow the food can feed their babies and this is ultimately life making life um, it's the continuation of what it is to be here together um, so I guess that's what I want to leave you with is that that shift of perception of instead of looking for the the new it paradigm the the formula the code to crack the vocabulary the the new innovation the thing thing look to life because everything is there and the life in you can recognize it and it will look to Raphael's point like poetry right that image of a mother feeding her baby is it's at the center of it all, isn't it? And the, all the organisms that live in the mother and all the organisms that live in the baby, they are all in relationship to the organisms all around us. So there's no way to draw a particular ecological circle around which babies are you going to feed, which is a completely violent question. So I, I want to, that's what I want to end with. How do we feed the babies? Thank you so much, everybody.